So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I am a plant molecular biologist. I come from the University in Aachen, from the Institute of Molecular Biotechnology, which works in close association with the Fraunhofer Institute for Molecular Biology and Applied Ecology, and that's why you will see this on the slide. So what I would like to um, talk about today is to give you an overview of uh, genome engineering, uh, describing some basic principles and how these are applied to plants. Uh, I will give you a short overview of the site-specific nucleases that are in use today and a special focus on the CRISPR-Cas system, which is the most relevant uh, lately. And then I will pass on to uh, give some uh, examples of application in, in plants and in plant biotechnology and uh, then try to draw some conclusions from it. So the first question is why do we need to use site-specific nucleases in plants at all? And this is all about mutations. Mutations, unfortunately, is a word that is uh, often associated for most of us with some negative uh, aspects. We know mutations cause cancer, there are mutagenic agents, and uh, mutants in the movies are always the bad guys, but they're actually the uh, essence of life as we know it. Without mutation, there wouldn't be evolution, there wouldn't be biodiversity. And uh, mutations are also the basis for plant breeding. Since men started uh, agriculture and they were selecting different plants to, to cross or for uh, special traits, they were actually looking for mutation without knowing it because mutation gives diversity. Uh, mutation from the molecular level arises from mistakes in the repair process when DNA is broken. Um, most of the cases, the DNA is repaired uh, seamlessly in a perfect way, but sometimes there are some mistakes and then they introduce mutation and then you have diversity. So when men realized this, um, they started in the 30s using uh, radiation or chemicals to induce mutations in uh, um, the crops they wanted to, to use for agriculture and for breeding. And this was a major breakthrough for agriculture because you could expand the actual availability of biodiversity. Um, Nevertheless, it's a rather uh, complex and uh, long procedure because you are uh, actually inducing mutation at random. So you have to do very large screening to be able to find, if you're lucky, the traits you're looking for. And then you have also a lot of mutations in the background that are not wanted and you have to backcross your uh, crop of interest to get rid of all these background mutations. Uh, things started to change in the 70s when the first molecular systems were discovered, these are uh, meganucleases, there are um, enzyme endonucleases that cut the DNA in a specific position. So you have a sequence that is recognized and they cut the DNA at that specific place. And especially the major breakthrough came when um, we were able to uh, generate programmable site-specific nucleases. This means that via several approaches that I will show you in a, in a second, we were able to change the specificity of this um, enzyme and then basically are able to target any site of uh, interest. And this is a, a very precise approach that does not relate on random with the genesis like what's been done uh, until now in, in agriculture. I just wanted to mention that there are also non-nuclease-based genome editing approaches, but these are out of the... Um, topic of this uh, presentation, but just for completeness. So, uh, with genome, enge genome engineering in plants, <coughs> you can uh, improve traits of plants by uh, generating loss of function, gain of function. You can, uh, for example, uh, very uh, interesting trait engineer pathogen resistance, and you can also do uh, via the modulation of transcription regulation um, uh, differentiate traits, but you can also introduce new traits. And you can even, with the tools that we have today, and we'll see that later, you can introduce completely new synthetic pathways into a plant. Um, so genome engineering and genome editing has two components. On one side, you have to uh, cut the DNA um, with the nucleases. On the other side, this has to be repaired by the cell. And this is a very important um, aspect. And in um, eukaryotic cell, there are basically two ways that uh, a break can be repaired, which are competing processes. And in uh, plants, like in the most, um, in the majority of uh, higher eukaryotes, uh, the so-called non-homologous end joining pathway is the uh, most frequent. In this case, when when you have a cleavage, a double strand the DNA break, uh, this is repaired just trying to basically close the put put them together, put them back together. And this is uh, very often an accurate process, but sometimes it also generates 
the so-called indels, short in, in deletion or insertion of bases that in the end generate mutations. And uh, in another application, if you also have a donor DNA, something can also be inserted via this uh, pathway. The other pathway is called homology directed repair. Uh, this is very um, rare in plants especially. Uh, but how does this work? This uh, happens when you introduce a template, a donor template, which is called, which has homology region to um, the sites that are um, adjacent to the break. And then if you have a small mutation in this template, this can be introduced. And this is um, actually leading to uh, what we call genome editing uh, sensor stricto. So you can really mutate as you want a single base and uh, yeah, it's also called gene conversion. And by this technology, if you have a homology region uh, flanking your donor, you can also introduce completely new uh, genes or a whole cassette or a new piece of information of DNA. On the um, uh, allelic level, what are the outcome of genome editing? I just want to mention shortly. So in the uh, simplest case of a diploid plant, you have two alleles for every trait and you can have an heterozygous outcome when only one allele is mutated. You can have a homozygous outcome when both are mutated the same way. And you can have a biallelic outcome when both alleles are mutated but with different kinds of mutations. So coming to these site-specific nucleases, what are they and, and what are the main uh, characteristics? The very first one to be um, discovered are meganucleases, which are uh, natural enzymes found in uh, bacteria. They recognize a rather long sequence, around 18 uh, base pair in length. And they were very useful in the beginning because they were the first tools that we uh, knew to, to cut a, a defined piece of DNA. But from their structure, they're very difficult to engineer. So the, um, the way they bind the DNA and the uh, uh, way they, they cleave the DNA are so much in, interconnected uh, that it's difficult to change the specificity. So basically, they have very little um, usability and have not been used uh, so extensively. The uh, second and revolutionary site-specific nucleases that came about were uh, zinc finger nucleases. And these are um, combined, uh, they work at dimers, so you need to have two uh, proteins to have the double strand break. The break is uh, performed by the FOC1 uh, <coughs> domain, which acts um, as a dimer, it says, and is unspecific, so it, it just cleaves. To give the specificity of the target that you want, you have this thin finger module. Each one of these uh, recognizes three base pairs, and then just puts in together several of the zinc fingers. You can have a specificity usually around 12, uh, 12 bases. And um, yeah, in, in total, so you have a much larger um, target sequence that you're going to, to address. Another very useful um, site-specific nucleases were the talons that are very similar to the zinc fingers. They also work with an unspecific cleavage domain from the FOC1, <coughs> which acts as a, a dimer. Uh, but in this case, this uh, specificity is given from single um, uh, element that uh, there is a, a single element known for each base. So you basically can just combine them as you want, like Lego pieces, and then you have a recognize your sequence of choice, and you can make that even a little bit longer. And the new kid on the block, you all know it, it's a CRISPR uh, cast system. Um, in this particular uh, case, we have um, a protein, which is a single protein, works as a monomer, which is uh, not given the specificity of the cleavage, so the process is always the same. The specificity of the target is defined by a so-called guide RNA, which is a, um, a, a sequence has a structural part, and then just 20 nucleotides that give the complementarity to the target in the genomic DNA, and then is recognized by the enzyme, and this makes the cleavage. In the specific case of the Cas9, the sequence that you're going to target has to have a pump sequence, which is an NGG. So apart from the meganucleases that I already said, they're not really relevant because they haven't been uh, really used because you can't uh, engineer them as you want. 
uh, the other type of nucleases have all different um, properties with respect to how they are assembled uh, and with respect also to their um, applicability in terms of how many targets you can find in the genome for these uh, nucleases depending on their requirements. But uh, if you just have a look at the literature in the last years, it's clear that the CRISPR-Cas9 system has just taken over all of the other um, nucleases and this is mainly for uh, the fact that in comparison to zinc finger and talent, it's very easy to use. So it's very efficient, first of all, but it's also very easy to reprogram because, as I said, you only have one protein and then this guide RNA is giving the uh, specificity, so there's no protein engineering involved. It also has the advantage that cleaves a methylated DNA, which uh, is a, a little bit troublesome with the other two. Uh, and the other big advantage that is seen it's that it's very uh, easy with this uh, system to do multiplexing, which means to target several positions in the genome at the same time, because you just give them one Cas9 protein, several different guide RNAs, and then you can have several targets in the same, in the same, at the same time. Uh, but it's not uh, all good news, so one of the main criticisms that has been um, address to the CRISPR-Cas technology is the uh, possibility of uh, inducing off-target effects. And what are these off-target effects? Uh, I said that the specificity is given by these 20 nucleotides that bind to the uh, DNA in the, in the genome, uh, but actually it was later found that it's only the uh, 12 nucleotides most proximal to this palm sequence that, are, um, that have to be exactly the same as the target. Well, here it allows some mismatches, and uh, this um, uh, leads to the fact that the, once you design a CRISPR um, guide RNA for one side, it can be that it targets, that it cleaves also other sequences that are um, highly homologous in the, in the genome. It also tolerates some bulges, so some uh, additional or uh, one base less, and uh, this actually this um, how to say uh, toleration of mismatches thought to be an intrinsic feature of the system because it was originally a system in prokaryotes to defend them from invading viruses and so to uh, avoid that the virus escape the, the immune system it, it tolerates some mutation. So how do we uh, can we get rid of of target effects or how do we control them? The very first and most important thing to do, uh, in my opinion, is to uh, do a, a very well and informed selection of the guide RNA. There are nowadays more and more information that are coming on the literature and evidence, experimental evidence, that allow to um, understand what are the rules underpinning the, um, the matching of the guide RNA to the, to, the, um, to the DNA. And there are uh, several uh, tools that are available online that can predict the uh, affinity of the guide RNA to the, the genome, and so you can select guide RNAs that actually don't have homology with other regions in the, in the genome. There's also been um, reports where uh, varying the length of the guide RNA was uh, improving a little bit the specificity. Uh, one other approach is to um, extend basically the um, length of the recognition, uh, the sequence that is recognized, like you have it for the uh, talent and the, and the zinc fingers, you basically, instead of having one enzyme that um, cuts both strands of the DNA, you inactivate one part, so the Cas9 only cleaves one side of the DNA, and then you combine two of them. And in this case, the uh, sequence that has to be recognized to have the double strand break is much longer and is less likely to be found somewhere else in the genome. And also there's been another approach um, really mimicking uh, the structure of the zinc fingers and the talons where the Cas9 uh, doesn't cut anymore, it's been mutated. Uh, it just gives the specificity of the target and then the uh, cleavage is uh, brought by the FOC1 uh, dimeric uh, nuclease. There's also been other approaches uh, trying to uh, increase the, the fidelity and uh, due to the uh, structure of the Cas9 and its interaction with the DNA and the RNA, it's been possible to uh, come up with two uh, high fidelity variants from um, protein engineering. 
And one hour last, but for me quite important aspect is also that you can somehow control the occurrence of, uh, of target effects also by your experimental setup. It's a quite um, obvious thing uh, that the longer the CRISPR-Cas9 complex is in the cell, the higher is the chance that it cuts somewhere else in the genome, that it, that it makes some mistakes. So um, there are uh, several methods that you can use to introduce the um, components of the system into the cells, and the likelihood of off-target mutation decreases. If you use, for example, a, a DNA which is integrated into the, uh, into the genome, um, you have uh, high chances of having uh, off-target effects because it makes a lot of copying and it's still there, it's still there longer. If you have DNA in transient, um, you have less chances, RNA is even less uh, present. And then there's the last uh, innovation, to deliver the complex already as a protein together with the RNA. You make the pre-complex uh, outside and then you deliver it to the cell as a protein complex with the guide RNA. And in this case, it's quite efficient because it's directly ready to, to act. So the editing efficiency on target is quite high, but it's uh, also rapidly degraded by the cell itself and during the normal cell metabolism. So it doesn't stay in that long. And this uh, helps also reduce the, the off-target effect. And uh, this has been first uh, used in uh, mammalian cells, in uh, animal cells, as most of the CRISPR stuff is. But it also, uh, lately, two reports have shown that this can be used also in plants. In plants, it's a little bit more tricky because you have the cell wall. So to deliver a protein inside the cell with the cell wall is not that easy, but um, we're getting there. We have uh, protocols being developed for that. So what are the applications that you can have in plants? As I said, what uh, are the methods that can be used to uh, deliver the components inside the cell? Uh, so mostly the work that has been done in plants and has been published has um, a deal with the stable integration of the components as DNA into the genome. Uh, delivery as RNA is also possible, but as, as far as I know, it's never been reported in plants. In some cases, in a few species that are also easily infected with uh, viruses, you can also infect with the virus, which is self-replicating, and then um, generates the, the, the CRISPR component inside the cells. And as I said, the last, this ribonucleoprotein complex that, uh, that has been um, showed, uh, quite, shown quite, uh, quite recently. And you can um, use it in uh, several tissues in the, in the plant and in, in also in plant cell culture. It's a quite efficient process. So uh, coming from the perspective of what is the outcome, they also here the most um, kind of editing that has been done in plants with the CRISPR-Cas system and in general with the site-specific nucleases is gene disruption. So basically you, you cleave a gene and then you, you hope that the repair system makes some mistakes and then you get a, a knockout, what we call it, so you, you lose the function of that gene. And this is quite efficient in plants. Uh, there are some variations depending on, um, on protocols and on, on, species, on, um, on the gene targeted, but almost in every species in which it has been shown so far, you have uh, examples of up to 100% of uh, editing efficiency, which is very, uh, very extraordinary. And uh, also the double uh, Nikes approach has been tested in plants. It has worked in uh, Rabidopsis and in rice, although the, so it has worked to decrease uh, the occurrence of target effects, of, although also the um, percentage of on-target effects has decreased in some, in some cases. You can also make two uh, cuts. Um, this is being done more and more often uh, also to, to induce a knockout because, of course, if you shoot twice, you have more... Uh, chances of, of killing something, uh, but it can also be done uh, with the intent of uh, deleting, of removing the DNA in between. And uh, as a matter of fact, there are examples of uh, deletion of large chromosomal segments uh, that have been done in rice with a quite surprising high efficiency. If you induce a double strand break, it can also happen that the uh, portion in between the two breaks is inverted 
or if the two breaks are on two different chromosomes, you can have also translocation, so like the two parts of the chromosome that are exchanging to each other. And although translocation has not been yet reported in plants, as far as I know, and chromosomal inversion are very rare, these are two quite interesting um, uh, uh, outcomes for breeders because uh, by this you can change somehow the way interesting traits are linked and then you can use them for breeding in a, in a more efficient way. Yeah, this is a slide just to show you the, um, how the multiplexing works. I already mentioned before, this is one of the strengths of the technology because it's very easy. You just need one uh, Cas9 nuclease, which is always the same, and then you have several guide RNAs that are targeting different genes, and then you can put them all together at once, and then you can um, address several genes at the same time. And this is also for uh, breeding and improving traits, a very, a very useful feature, of course. Some example of gene disruption, what has been done uh, in uh, two cases, for example, uh, resistance to pathogen has been increased by knocking out or by disrupting genes that are used by the pathogen to invade the plant. And in another case, uh, for example, the um, yield uh, of, the, of the grain in, in rice was increased by, by knocking out genes uh, related to this, um, to this trait. Uh, although there are uh, many uh, different um, approaches that have been used in the literature, it's not always um, easy to compare different experiments. We try to uh, analyze the data that are available to see if there are any difference between the application of these nucleases in different plants. And we uh, analyze um, cereals, in particular cereal crops, because uh, the, especially the very early uh, works done with the uh, earlier uh, site-specific nucleases were using um, cereals, cereal crops. And what turned out from this analysis from the literature data is that it actually the difference in the mutation signature uh, are there, but they depend on the nucleases rather than the species. And this is most likely because the uh, repair pathway are quite conserved in these species, and also because the, um, the specificity of each of these nuclease is that they leave a, a different overhangs in their, in their cleavage. So Cas9 makes a, double, a blunt double strand break, uh, which is quite efficiently repaired. Uh, and and uh, talon and zinc finger nucleases make five prime um, uh, overhangs, but of different length, while mega nucleases make three prime overhangs in the break. They are um, differently processed by the repair mechanism in the cells. And that's why uh, by uh, CRISPR-Cas9, usually, mostly, you have um, indels, so insertion or deletion, there are less than 10 bases. Most of, very often, you have just one base that is added or deleted. And, um, and yeah, and in, typically, the insertion are uh, AT. This is also an interesting feature to observe. Uh, Why uh, in talents, you have uh, also, a little bit larger, but uh, still small deletion. And zinc fingers, for example, in comparison to Tale, you still have a little bit more insertions. This is due to the, to the longer overhangs that they, um, that they leave. And uh, this is not my view, but I just report for what, what is uh, found in the literature. They might uh, be of a potential disadvantage for regular uh, to, uh, a regulatory approval process because of the insertion might be seen less uh, um, kindly than deletions. And meganucleases, in the end, they make a quite large uh, deletions uh, and uh, an insertion up to 70 base pairs. So even though we, we can find a trend in the mutation signature from the different nucleases, it uh, has to be said that all four can also generate larger indels. And it's important also to mention that any uh, treatment or physiological states that influence the way the cell repairs the, the, the damage can also influence the outcome. So it's not, uh, it's not independent on the state of the, of the cell. And also, uh, there are some cases in which it looks like there are gene-specific factors that influence the outcome of the repair because um, there are some genes that uh, in different approaches but are always repaired in the same uh, way with the same... Uh, kind of indels. 
and also it's worth to mention that um, the Cas9 double knee case generates longer overhangs. Uh, in, in one case, there were like 52 overhangs, and this also leads to uh, much larger insertions, for example. So if you want to um, have smaller insertion, you should uh, take this into, into com consideration. What about off-target effects in plants? Off-target activity is generally rare in plants. So in contrast to the first report that were um, published on mammalian cells, uh, there are very uh, few cases in, where, um, in, in which um, off-target mutations are reported, and where they are reported, they only tend to involve the minority of the gRNA, so they're not really um, so, so prominent. And uh, in some cases, uh, just by the careful design of the, of the experiment on the selection of the guide RNA, you can ensure a specific target even when you have genomes like those from cereal crops, for example, where you have a lot of repetition uh, of sequence and you are, uh, uh, have closely related parallel genes, you can still target them specifically. This has been shown. And uh, off-target effects also can be reduced or avoided if you select the appropriate progeny that does not have the, the CRISPR component inside anymore so that they're not active and they, they don't generate this, this kind of off-target. And what I want to point out that in all publications that we could um, analyze, the frequency of off-target mutation is still much, much lower than that of on-target mutation. And in all of the papers uh, describing an experiment where you have several mutants, it was always possible to recover edited plants with the on-target desired edited sequence without off-target mutation. So it's only a matter of screening, but it looks like it's not such a big problem. And uh, for those that are not familiar with plants, um, the uh, tissue culture process that we use to regenerate plants is uh, per se also generating mutations, somatic mutations that appear to uh, happen more frequently than the off-target mutation generated by the crispr cas system. Using the homology director repair pathway, where you give a, a template, it can be a single-stranded oligonucleotide or it can be a double-stranded oligonucleotide. Uh, and with this approach, as I said, you can uh, really introduce the exact change that you want to, uh, to make. Um, it's been done. It works. Uh, but uh, as I already mentioned, this pathway is um, less frequent in plants, so it's not that easy to to achieve these uh, this results. But nevertheless, for example, there is uh, one um, <coughs> yeah, report of a trait uh, where they induced herbicide resistance in rice, just uh, mutating a, a single amino acid, and they conferred resistance to the herbicide. Um, With the same pathway, you can also, as I mentioned, insert something inside. Um, this is uh, even less likely to happen in plants because if you want to introduce something, you need uh, quite some large homology region, and this does not happen very, very efficiently. And with this technique, you can also uh, remove something and introduce something at the same time. This is called gene replacement. You can think of just exchanging a, a gene, but there's a uh, one last uh, application that I wanted to mention is uh, a transgenic application of the CRISPR-Cas system, but it's quite interesting um, because if you have the, uh, introduced the CRISPR-Cas9 system in a plant and uh, make it in such a way that it targets uh, the DNA from in the invading pathogens, you can have a plant that is resistant to, to viral DNA. Uh, and it's just a little bit like the... the acquired immunity of the CRISPR-Cas9 itself in, uh, in bacteria. And this has been uh, tested by uh, three groups independently and it worked quite efficiently. You can reduce the uh, levels of infection even down to plants that do not show symptoms at all. So to come uh, to the conclusion, uh, what I wanted to point out is that the outcome of the genome editing in plants, but probably not only, is influenced by the type of site-specific nuclease that you use by the repair mechanism of the cell, because it's a fundamental uh, step when you generate a double stem break, and also we can influence it by the delivery method. And as uh, what literature is telling us, 
until now, off-target effects are not such a big problem in plants. They seem to be uh, really limited. I wanted to point out also some plant-specific feature, something you cannot do with, with mammalians or uh, with other cells. You can segregate out the CRISPR components. You can make a transgenic plant that has the CRISPR components in there, and then you can segregate it out and just end up with a transgene-free edited plant in the end. With these ribonucleoprotein protein, with ribonucleoprotein complexes, if you deliver them, then you end up with a DNA-free mutated plant, which is nothing different like a plant mutated via the classical mutagenesis method, um, like a MS or, or radiation, because you don't have DNA in, entering there. And also off-target effects. If, if they are there, we can always remove them by backcrossing, like it was done in the normal uh, tilling and um, breeding procedure, like for for what's been done until now. And then I just tried to sum up the conclusion pointing out the limits, possibility, and future develops that were mentioned in this uh, section. So the limits, at least those perceived, are the off-target effects. Um, and these have to be improved. I think there's still quite some improvement, but we are uh, on the right way to, uh, um, to be done on the side of the delivery of the ribonucleoprotein complex into the plant cells, because in my opinion, this is the the way to go because you don't have DNA involved and it's really a promising approach. And also we have to improve our understanding in the cell repair process because, uh, as I said, this is strictly um, interconnected to the outcome of genome editing. The possibilities are enormous, I don't have to, to tell you that. And the future development, still to work on the improved specificity, there are already also enzymes that instead of cleaving the DNA, they directly change one base, chemically change. So this is also quite interesting and is being developed. And um, from my personal point of view, um, I think that the combination of a promiscuous protein that doesn't have a cleavage specificity plus RNA combination that gives the specificity of the target is the, the best probably uh, option that we can have at least for, for plant engineering because you don't deliver DNA, but you still have the flexibility of, uh, of changing target. It will, be, will probably not remain a CRISPR-Cas9. There will be new uh, development, but in my opinion, this is the, the most uh, promising technology. I would just like to, to quickly thank the people that are working on genome editing at uh, my institute and uh, Fraunhofer Emet and our colleague in uh, University of Leiden, you all for your attention.